Hi, May babies. It is your girl Melody Almay, and welcome back to another banger, baby. Welcome back to part two of my book club reaction. I'm so excited to do this reaction because, as y'all know, this book is juicy. Okay, as you guys can tell by the audio, your girl is really investing into some new technology to make sure I continuously elevate this channel. So from now on, I will be recording from my microphone, and hopefully, this makes a quality difference. Comment below if you guys like this audio better what you guys need me to do to make this channel great but as you guys can tell by the title description this is going to be part two of my reaction to Hamer's book Juked okay you guys I've been reading your comments and your responses from my part one and thank you guys so much for interacting with me and showing me what your thoughts of was from Juked even the author himself Nathan Hamer hit me up and told me that he really really enjoyed my part one so that's why we're here okay because I'm gonna get my May babies with they need which is some great content so honestly we're gonna just get right into it because i'm gonna be giving you guys this part two from chapter 17 until 34 so yeah this is gonna be a pretty lengthy review but i hope you guys enjoy i was even thinking about splitting it into like three parts but i'm not gonna make you guys wait any further for this reaction okay because there's just so much to unpack as you guys already seen from part one and you know i'm gonna give it to you my baby so we're gonna get right into it if you guys like this video make sure you guys thumbs up go smash that subscribe button and join the may baby family because we are on the road to 20,000 subscribers and i feel like i have been saying this for the longest but we need to get there okay we need to get there by the end of this video i need you guys to get this video to at least 10,000 views okay at least 10k because yours is going to be missing out if you don't smash that subscribe button and if you are already a may baby you should know that may babies are the best people in the world and you can only become a may baby if you go smash that subscribe button and smash that notification bell so you know when Whenever I make a new post and let's get into this book club reaction of part two of Jute. Okay, my babies, let's get right into it. Chapter 17 of Jute. Okay, in chapter 17, Mr. Hamer got into why he replaced the old sponsor, DT. And he said the reason why he replaced the old sponsor with a new sponsor, which is Jatara, is because he wanted new, fresh leadership with the dogs. Mr. J appointed KP as the new captain, and him and Mr. Hammer were on the same page that this was the clear choice. A little background, you guys. Whenever there is a new captain, the band director appoints them, usually the year before. And to give you guys some background, a little refreshment, you know, Mr. J was the band director before Mr. Hamer. And before Mr. J, I believe it was Isaac Griggs. So it's really only three band directors. Just to give you guys some background, Mr. J was band director before Mr. Hamer. Mr. Hamer says selecting KP as the captain was the first best choice he's ever made in his career as band director, but then learned that this decision would also be a challenge. <sighs> you guys wow i was i was so surprised to hear this but kind of not surprised because i know hbcus don't want to pay nobody but i was very surprised to find out that the dancing doll sponsor is an unpaid job so you don't get paid nothing to be a sponsor for the dolls and mr hammer said he had to face one of his biggest fears getting involved to day-to-day -day matters of the dancing dolls so mr hammer did not mention any names as far as dolls or even the drum major but i'm gonna tell you guys the names okay i'm gonna tell you guys the names because it's apparent that who it is it's kp and kp went to mr hamer with a list of things we needed because dt wasn't there okay being a doll at this time in 2015 dt was not there the most that we seen her was during crab week which is basically the first week of practice and after crab week we did not see her besides the game so kayla had to basically figure it out so kayla basically was fed up and we even as crabs knew our crab year that kayla and dt was not really on the best terms we didn't know the details of what issues were specifically going on because we were crabs but from mr hamer's book we see exactly what was going on with atar and kp so like i said kayla went to mr hamer with a list of things that he needed to take care of because dt was not available dt lived four hours away and she was the help so mr hamer had to jump into action because the help was four hours away so it's amazing to learn all the things kp had to do to ensure that we were 
were good. Mr. Hamer said that this was a bonding time between him and KP during this time because he really didn't talk to the dancing dolls or really know them on a personal level until now, until Kayla had came with him and was like, all right, we need tights, we need gloves, we need so much stuff. And Mr. Hamer was like, all right, let's get it done. In the meantime, let's get to know each other. So in the time that Kayla and Hamer had their bonding, KP finally told him her stance on DT. So here was the issues. So DT had a communication issue and when she wasn't present, KP had to figure everything the fuck out, okay? And when she made decisions, DT always had an issue with it. Mr. Hamer said he knew if he didn't mend the relationship between DT and KP, something bad would happen. And his instincts was right. Oh Lord. <laughs> when Mr. Hamer mentioned the LA Tech game, my heart sunk. If you guys know, you know. That was not our best game. Not only for us crabs, but even for the upperclassmen. During the LA Tech game, DT was mad that KP had the uniforms altered. So Mr. Hamer did not care about them damn uniforms. DT did. DT was so pissed off at the uniforms that Kayla went behind her back and got them done without asking and altered the uniforms, even though she made the uniforms look better. She said that DT went to Hamer and she still insisted on a two week suspension as a consequence for this trying to convince mr hamer that quote if a band member altered their uniforms what would you do hamer of course responds zip they ass and because dt was firing hamer up he backed dt up and started playing mind games with kp as well as danny i don't know how danny got involved but i guess just guilty by association guilty by crag class but danny got in trouble as well and quote even though a two-week suspension is long enough i'm going to suspend the girls indefinitely they won't know the length of their suspension but i still plan to make it two weeks this is what hamer told atara so him and atara were basically playing mind games with danny and kayla telling them that they're suspended indefinitely knowing in the back of their head that it's only going to be a two-week suspension so that they can basically make an example out of them in front of the whole dancing dolls and in front of the whole entire band and mr hamer said that Datara fired him up to do this to kp and daniel langford okay you guys brief side story i remember this interaction when we were crabs and after our LA Tech game and I already told you guys and I gave you guys some background how I felt after I messed up that game and I texted Kayla and I was like can I please practice this was after all that okay this was probably the following week and we came to practice and we did not see our captain and our co-captain we were like Ooh what's going on here so how practice went that day we just practiced normally and we later found out later that kayla and danny got in trouble because altering the uniforms and they were actually speaking to mr hamer and Datara in his office right now and as you guys know he told them that they're suspended indefinitely and to us that means that they're off the team when we got the news that kayla and danny were suspended indefinitely we balled everybody balled the upperclassmen balled connor who was appointed standing captain she bald she did not want that position at all anybody who felt that she wanted that opportunity i'll tell you right now that connor she hated that that happened to her because she did not want that responsibility she did not want all of that she did not see that for herself she just wanted to be a doll okay she didn't care about being captain so when mr hammer brought us all into the office and told us what he's going to do moving forward because like literally when we were practicing and mr hammer was having his meeting with kayla and danny we were just thinking like okay he's gonna have to forgive them like it's kayla and danny like they are it's like they are those girls but they literally took their stuff and walked out of the doll room we tried to talk to them but they were like all right he told us to leave and we were like like literally the rest of the day we could not even practice we were just crying and bawling and mr hammer called us all in the office to talk to us as a team and tell us exactly what he told them that they're suspended indefinitely so he announced to connor what she's gonna have to do she cried and we all were sad and after that meeting we all just met at the bluff which is the most beautiful spot on campus it basically overlooks the mississippi river it's like this big tree and a bench basically overlooking everything and that's where we met to talk about everything Thing. Kayla just told us as a uh, crab class just to like be strong without her and we just wanted to prove to her that we can do it for her and that's exactly what we did in that moment so honestly that moment really made us stronger as a crab class because we realized that we can do it even without our captain but we still honestly needed her and we were glad that she came back but anyway that's just a little side story of how our experience was as dolls when Kayla and Danny 
game were suspended. A few hours after he gave KP and Danny the news, they couldn't even come to practice and all hell went loose. Even President Fulton got the word and wanted Mr. Hamer's head. Everybody wanted Mr. Hamer's head at that point. Everybody rolled for Kayla, okay? They would die for Kayla. Oh Hamer said that President Fulton didn't know a dancing doll from the hole in his ear. He was super surprised when he heard Fulton trying to fight for Kayla. Dumas, who is Mr. Hamer's boss, as you guys know from part one, Dumas, 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 he comes back, sent him an email demanding that Kayla and KP be reinstated immediately for the Boombox Classic. And Mr. Hamer even admitted that he started to let his ego get the best of him, stating that he stood his ground. He felt that because of him, the band got huge social media attention, which made these dancing dolls stars. So basically Mr. Hamer said they stars because of him. Now they have a fan base including administrators backing them and he was upset with the dolls for sharing to the world what he decided to do to them. That's where I was confused. I wonder why Mr. Hamer was mad that Kayla and Danny told everybody what they did to them. Of course he's gonna get backlash because of that. But after two weeks of being suspended KP and Danny were back. Back and better than ever. But the problem shifted from why are they gone to why isn't KP in the front leading. Mr. Hamer claimed that he reinstated the captain quote unquote when he was ready and admitted KP was a star and she elevated the dancing dolls brand no matter what position she played and that's facts and I put on that's on period okay because I remember when KP and Danny finally came back I think it was the ASU game I think that was the boombox classic I'm not sure baby Kayla was like right in front of me and baby when Kayla was in front of me, I had to match Kayla. Kayla was shitting on me. You know in the 2015 Q&A video series with all my crab sisters, Jordan said that Danny was shitting on her all season. Especially yeah. since my crab year, I had to dance right next to her. Right. She really shitted on me every game. <laughs> <laughs> every game, she shitted on me. I was like, what is happening? And I used to always just be looking back like, that's how I felt in that one game with Kayla dancing in front of me, okay? My captain was shitting on me, but it was okay because it helped me grow as a doll and embody Kayla. That's who I really wanted to embody as a doll is KP because she just gave. Like, even when Connor was leading in the front, they were still screaming Kayla's name. Okay, my babies, now let's go ahead and move on to chapter 18. Chapter 17, as you guys can tell, was pretty long. So let's go ahead and move on. So Mr. Hammer wanted to make a documentary about the band, and it's called The Band Plays On by Gary Gary. Introduce Hamer to someone who will market the documentary, Sharon. Remember that name, Sharon. Mr. Hamer and this lady named Sharon grew close and they had something in common. They were both divorced. Mr. Hamer said Sharon had, quote unquote, the hots for Hamer time. The hots for Hamer time. Yikes. He said Sharon checked all the boxes, but she simply quote unquote, wasn't his type. And now that I think about it, I remember seeing Sharon around. She never spoke to us or even like spoke to the band or even had like a really like significant role. I remember her riding the back of the golf cart whenever Mr. Hamer had drove the golf cart to practice at the practice field. This random lady was always in the back of his golf cart. And I always wondered who that lady was. Now I know it was Sharon. Okay, now y'all, here we get to the part. Wow. Page 112. Quote, I admit I was lonely. Dot, dot, dot. We basically had had all the benefits of a relationship without one thing, sex. Ooh. I paid for everything because I was paying for an escape from my lonely, depressing, career-driven life. He continues, instead of trying to make amends with my ex-wife, I sought companionship with a woman that I had no interest in sexually. Ooh, wow. Now we get to this crazy part, y'all. So on page 115, I'm just gonna read an excerpt real quick, but just to give you guys a little disclaimer slash heads up, Mr. Hamer was drugged and almost date by Sharon and she brought him back to her place to take advantage of him. So I'm gonna read you some excerpts from page 115 so you guys can understand the gravity of the situation. I began to panic, still sucked in by the couch. Sharon walked closer and started kissing me. She shoved her tongue down my throat as I mumbled, no, no. I don't know if I was saying no aloud or in my head, but I was trying to take control of the situation while still sucked in the couch. Sharon began to unbuckle my belt and unzip my jeans. I felt her hands in my under 
underwear as she began to play with my male anatomy. My pants were coming down as I felt the warmth of her mouth on my male anatomy. I knew that I was fighting a losing battle. She began to open the buttons on my shirt and laid her body on top of mine. I went from comfortable to suffocating. I remember the smell of Sharon's body spray. It was a good smell, but the pressure from her weight on top of my weak and inebriated body must have forced it to go into survival mode as I muscled up the strength to push her off me onto the floor. As I heard her body hit the floor, I jumped up in a panic and grabbed my keys and ran to the door as fast as I could with my pants still down to my ankles. I managed to get outside and climbed into my truck and sped off into the night. Thank God I made it home. Without reading the whole page to you guys, to give you guys a little background, how Mr. Hammer even ended up at her house is because they had dinner together, right? He trusted her at this point. He went off to use the bathroom and when he came back, he took a sip of his drink and immediately he felt, why do I feel like this? I feel like I'm literally about to pass out. I've only took one sip of my drink. I know my limit. I know that I'm not like this. My body does not act like this over one sip of a drink. He knew that Sharon had basically drugged him. Yeah, Sharon basically had the valet person pull up his truck and put him in his car, drove him to her house and tried to take advantage of him. So that was crazy to hear. That was so crazy. Like I had no idea. So on page 116, Mr. Hamer didn't tell anybody that he was drugged and almost he feared that it would make him look weak and Mr. Hamer had a powerful world so he would do anything. He would go as far as not even telling people that he got almost got date just to make himself look powerful and strong and not weak which is messed up that he felt like he couldn't tell anybody what happened. Mr. Hamer did tell the MBM team what happened minus the going to the doc. Oh Mr. Hamer did go to the doctor by the way. I think it was like that night or the next day. Ultimately the doctor later confirmed that a date drug was in his system. Rofenol, Rofenol? I think that's how you pronounce it, Rofenol. I'll pop it right here, but he was definitely drugged by Sharon. So he told the NBM team what happened minus the going to the doctor part. And he said they did what men do, they laughed. Instead of caring about what happened, they laughed. So a month after the situation, Mr. Hammer stopped at home to get the new drill sheet formations for practice when Sharon showed up at his house because she had been following him. After five minutes of asking her to leave and her refusing with her foot in the door, he simply said, wave hi to the camera. And she sped off rubber burning. Sharon got the fuck. Mr. Hammer knew this wasn't the end of it. Sharon showed up again at his office in front of all his band students. Mr. Hammer played it cool, asking her to come and give him a hug as he whispered in her ear, SUPD is on the way. <laughs> I hope y'all heard that. I said SUPD is on the way, okay? The Southern University Police Department is on its way, coming for you. She panicked and calmly walked the fuck away. Hamer is so funny. He met a new friend named Marissa and he didn't tell Marissa about Sharon. So Sharon showed up and she barged in his office while he was talking to Melissa, right? And he had to leave Sharon with Melissa because he had to go talk to his band students about a performance that was coming up. He had other priorities rather than to deal with Sharon at that moment. So he left Sharon Sharon and Melissa in his office while he talked to his band students, mind you. So Mr. Hamer came back to his office to see Sharon wrote all over his calendar. Sharon is childish. Sharon wrote on his calendar and the dates, things such as take Sharon out, take Sharon shopping, etc. He ripped out the page, but then he sees she drew in something in all the dates until December. So he had to throw the whole calendar away because of Sharon, Sharon being childish. So Mr. Hamer and Melissa was in his office when they heard another knock at the door and previously Obviously, they already agreed to go out to eat that night. But Melissa walks away saying she'll see him at the car. Sharon insists she's leaving with him. And he said, Sharon, get the fuck out of here. Damn. <laughs> Mr. Hamer said, Sharon, get the fuck out of here. Damn. I literally laughed out loud when I read that. When Mr. Hamer met with Melissa later on that day for their dinner, he then learned that while he was left to talk to the band, he later then learned what Sharon and Melissa talked about while Mr. Hamer went and talked to the band. Sharon went behind the desk and says she wanted Mr. Hamer to loosen up and go out more. And that's when she wrote all the bullshit in his calendar. Melissa set her up about the exclusive club they were going to tonight. This is how Melissa has set Sharon up about an exclusive club. So this is what Melissa said. Hamer, you know me. I put on my sophista ratchet voice and I told that hoe. That's funny because Nathan and I go out to eat all the time. In fact, Nathan has taken me to all the exclusive spots and we're going, we're even going somewhere exclusive tonight. <laughs> she said she went on to Ad. That hoe ain't have nothing to say back. I could tell that she was mad because she was writing something all over your desk. Mr. Hamer said, you mean to tell me that you got in Sharon's head so bad that she left campus, drove 30 minutes or more to her house, hopefully took a bath, found something 
came to where to an quote unquote exclusive club, drove back 30 plus minutes to campus while driving through homecoming traffic, took another 20 to 30 minutes to find a parking spot on campus just to come to the office and get mad, slam my door, and on her way I repeat the process all over again while leaving campus. <laughs> Mr. Hamer said he couldn't even get through half of his statement. Marissa was laughing and they basically laughed the whole night long. Chapter 19. That was, yeah, that was a pretty uh, intense chapter, chapter 18. So let's go ahead and get into chapter 19. We're gearing up towards the end of the season, Bayou Classic. And Mr. Hamer stated that the 2015 season was the longest season that he ever experienced. And he was tied. This kind of tied. I feel that. I feel like 2015 was a long ass season. Like compared to the rest of my seasons as a dancing doll, 2015 definitely was a long season. Not only because I was crabbing, but because all the shit that was going on in 2015. Tension started to pour amongst the assistant band directors, Taylor and Brian. It first stemmed from one feeling like the other was getting more camera time exposure. Another being Taylor accusing Brian of having a sexual relationship with a band member. <laughs> that just threw me off, y'all. When I read that, I was like, what? I'm not gonna lie, like as an undergrad, we heard of this, but it's never been facts. Like it's never been proven facts. So that's how you know that it was a lie because stuff around Southern, if it's true or not, is going to get around. But there was never evidence of Brian ever having a relationship with a band member. Mr. Hamer said that Taylor made that up to make Brian look bad. Brian knew Taylor was behind his lie. And Taylor would gain nothing from telling this, but it showed his true character and entitlement. Mr. Hamer finally admitted that taking over everyone's issue and problems in the band, he started to abuse alcohol to cope. He admitted that he had a severe alcohol addiction. He said he recalled drinking a whole 1792 bottle of Kentucky whiskey in his truck, walked to his office and passed the fuck out. He recalled that day he wanted to actually end it all. He thought he wasn't going to make it. At the ASU game, Mr. Hamer continued to ignore the headset rules and this time Dumas and his cronies came up to him to confront him about playing and why they had all these new instruments without his approval and Mr. Hamer couldn't hear him over the jukebox blowing and basically said man bye I have a job to do when I tried to talk to you you didn't want to talk now is not the time Mr. Hamer then had an unofficial meeting with the board of supervisors at the president's old house on campus they knew Dumas and Mr. Hamer weren't getting along at the meeting Mr. Hamer recalled Dumas standing off to the side with his arm folded looking like a 12 year old kid on punishment at recess. A DA member spoke saying that they were concerned about Mr. Hamer's ability to work with Dumas as therefore he will have a new boss under academic affairs which is not Dumas. I was so weak at Mr. Hamer saying Sharon the he still had to deal with her because she was the spearhead of the fundraiser for the band but he was ready to get it over so he wouldn't have to deal with her anymore. He then later learned that Sharon was actually a mole sent by Dumas. Sharon ended up suing Mr. Hamer in 2017 for an unfulfilled contract even though her event flopped and she even pulled out. She sued him again in 2018. Sharon the R word sued him again in 2018 just to tarnish his name in the media and he learned from Dumas's loose lips that she'd been wanting to sue him since 2016. Mr. Hamer was tired of powerful people using the human jukebox for their own purposes and he knew that it would all fall apart if he didn't get all the band funds in his personal account situated for. Who's child y'all? That was only three chapters. Chapters. And we got a lot more to dig into, so chapter 20. So Mr. Hamer hired an academic advisor and he was so successful with the students, but then he was later fired by the university. And Mr. Hamer wanted to know why. And the academic advisor said it started with you. Hamer said he never holds more than a two minute conversation in his office due to his mistrust. So he had most of his conversations in his truck so it could be confidential. So Mr. Hamer later finds out from the academic advisor that he was actually hired to get tea on Mr. Hamer. But when the reports came back good that Mr. Hamer actually cared about his band students and they deeply respected him, the academic advisor was fired. Mr. Hamer claimed that the academic advisor was the second mole sent from Dumas after Sharon. Mr. Hamer admitted that he grown a deep hatred because Dumas was really seriously obsessed. Hamer admitted that he was over the moon when Dumas wasn't his boss anymore. The 2016 season was coming in. Hamer had a financial meeting with the board of supervisors and it ended in quote unquote a ghetto mess with an hour-long meeting going nowhere. Mr. Hammer said every time that he tried to plead about the plight of the beloved human jukebox, it always fell on deaf 
years. So now we get into chapter 21. Oh Lord, the flood of 2016. So the flood of 2016 actually ruined Mr. Hammer's home and it downed his house in six feet of water. Wow. Mr. Hammer said that when he purchased his home eight years ago, his homeowners association said he didn't have to purchase flood insurance since they were outside of the flood zone. Now he had an inhabited house and he had to live out of a hotel for four months from August until December. Hammer could no longer afford to pay his mortgage and hotel fees so he had to move into his garage and sleep on an air mattress. Hammer said he became depressed and began to self-medicate again with alcohol. When they finally performed at the Battle of the Bands it lifted everybody's spirits including Mr. Hammer finally lifting him out of depression. Mr. Hammer admitted that during the first game he was upset when a governor elect came to him during the game trying to give him a catty heads up saying Dumas is still running his mouth telling people that Mr. Hamer is using the band for performances and pocketing the money. Hamer said this encounter ruined his whole entire mood for the rest of the game. So Hamer wanted the Crankfest Battle of the Bands to just be as big as a football game. And that's what the Crankfest was. Hamer said he did receive a small $2,500 honorarium for the Crankfest Battle and split it three ways between Mr. Hart, Tyler, and Brian reserving none for himself because he was going for the big bucks which means raises for the entire staff jsu versus su crankfest was so successful that tj already set up another crankfest against tsu ocean of soul hammer thought this would be a great opportunity to strengthen recruitment efforts in texas and this is when the church service became a tradition us as a band we really really needed that at that time because you guys know that we go through so much scrutiny as an organization god being the center of it all just put all of our minds at ease Mr. Hamer ends chapter 21 saying that after TSU Crankfest, Hamer and all of his staff received an honorarium. So now let's get into chapter 22. Starting off already in the first sentence of the chapter, quote, 2017 was starting off in the worst possible way. Hamer was still depressed due to his living situation, which was him living in the garage. Mind you, I had no idea that Hamer was going through this while we were dolls in the band. I had no idea Hamer's house got inhabited and he was actually staying in his garage and that he was going home to his garage every day after band practice. At the start of 2017 Mardi Gras parade season, Hammer got a call from his twin brother that Sharon, the R word, is not only suing Hammer again, but President Belton and the whole entire SU board of supervisors. Hammer figured this has Duma's name written all over it. Six weeks later, Hammer's brother called back saying that the lawsuit was retracted. Hammer decided not to renew the contract on the NBM team and Sonia, uh, Sonia, 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 Sonia Norwood, which is Brandy and Reggie Mama, had advice to Mr. Hamer that he was making the move too prematurely of deciding not to renew the contract of the NBM team. Ultimately, Hamer decided that he would give the NBM team a year, which is until 2018, to step it up. The NBM team is the marketing and brand management team, by the way, if you guys don't know what the NBM team is. Hamer also ended the chapter saying how much he appreciated Sonia. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, by the way. How much he appreciated Sonia for helping him through this time. Now we begin chapter 23. Sonia started a group message on social media called Fifth Quarter Fan Club. Even though she dropped the human jukebox name from in front, Mr. Hammer still got heat from it because the group message held a lot of controversial issues. And Hammer learned that Dumas was a finalist in the presidential search for Payne College, which is a very small HBCU in Augusta, Georgia. Hammer said he was actually very happy for Dumas. And it was so funny when Mr. Hammer said, quote, I also knew that if Payne College hired Brandon Dumas, it would be less pain for me. The fifth quarter fan club attempted to derail Dumas's opportunity by making public his dirty business works and Hamer said even though he did not like him this was wrong and unfortunately Dumas didn't get the job at Payne College. I remember when Hamer took all of us in the band hall so we can all vote yes for the referendum and of course the referendum passes 88 percent by students voting yes. Hamer posted this on his personal page thanking all the Southern Knights for voting yes and he got into more trouble with the administrators. After congratulating him on the referendum getting passed, President Belton also threatened Mr. Hamer about changing the social media policy to the faculty. But that was just him just blowing hot air because there is no such policy that went to pass. Hamer's plan was to use the money from the referendum to utilize the money for raises for his staff. Hamer submitted the project raises, but the VP or Finance Administration, which is Flandis McClinton, Flandis, I don't even know how to pronounce this man. 
mean? I'm gonna call this nigga Flounders denied the project raises and said the raise was far too much money. Even though the money didn't come from the university, it came from the referendum, he still denied it. Hammer continues to explain how Taylor backstabbed him. He told a trusted member of the LLI all-star band that he didn't trust Hamer after the referendum passed and that the $25,000 raise slash increase must be something wrong. That's not like Taylor. Got to be something wrong. Hamer promoted Taylor to assistant. I don't know why he did this, but he promoted Taylor to the assistant band director and a $25,000 raise and Taylor still was not satisfied. Taylor said to Brian Simmons, quote, Hamer can't justify giving me $70,000, you $65,000, while he'll be making $120,000. That ain't fair. May I remind you, may I remind you, Hamer found ways to pay Taylor, Taylor in particular, because the university was actually refusing to pay him. Wow, as I read on, I didn't know that Mr. Hamer's 10 year plan was to eventually build a new band hall. Imagine if that came into fruition. I already knew Mr. Hart, who was a percussion director, still is the percussion instructor, was the only one grateful about their pay, as well as Miss Bird. And Mr. Hammer said, quote, for the love of money is the root of all evil, began to lurk at the front door due to my salary increase and sense of high fashion. Hamer admitted that he did not help this issue due to his unorthodox problem of hiding band camp funds to pay the band and dancing dolls bills and expenses. Every year this was eating at Mr. Hamer's conscience because he was often accused of making money off of band performances. Even though Mr. Hamer said he had good reasons for doing so, he knew either way it would make him look bad on his behalf. And it only would be a matter of time before the shit hit the fan. And here we go, chapter 24. Chapter 24 was a long chapter. So let's Let's go ahead and get into chapter 24. So this is a little side story, my babies. Okay, the buses. Whenever the dolls, whenever we travel to any type of away games or any type of performances, we rolled bus four. I'll show you guys a little clip from 2016 of Micah and I think it was Teneria doing a little bus four dance right here. Bus four. Hey. 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 <laughs> bus four. Hey. Oh. Hey. Not the pin drop. <laughs> it wasn't as serious as the band took it as far as which bus we rode. We just rode the bus with all the girl band members. I also play this clip that I found on Snapchat of the doll Taylor's crab year, y'all, when she first got onto the bus and realized how ratchet the band really is. Here's the clip. <laughs> I'll even put in the clip of Maya falling asleep on the bus. There's just so many memories on bus four. Bus four was just everything. But I wanted to give you guys that background because you guys want to hear about the bus story, okay? So Hammer went on a trip to Indiana with Mr. Taylor and Brian, as well as his boss. Long story short, it was a great trip where they could bond and get to know each other. Hammer still didn't trust Taylor because he saw with his own eyes this time in Taylor's phone, he was talking about Hammer. But Mr. Hammer was able to get the human jukebox and the logo engraved on the instrument so all in all he thought that this trip was a win it's funny when mr hammer was talking about the dorms we tried to attempt us to have with stay in the dorms but it was dirty and full of pests i actually tried to stay in the dorms during the summertime because during the summertime for some reason they won't let us stay in the apartments on campus and the apartments is really the only housing on campus that don't have roaches and isn't like a thousand years old so a little side story i tried to attempt to move into the dorms for the summertime during band camp that I was taking summer school. I lasted one day, not even a night. I didn't even spend the night there because I saw a roach and I was like, oh no, I'm not putting any of my stuff in this room so I can bring back roaches anywhere I go. No ma'am, I can't do pests. Hopefully they've gotten rid of the roaches at Southern. So I understand Mr. Hammer's concerns about the band not staying in the dormitories during the summertime. And another little side story, as you guys know, I literally live with every single one of my crab sisters. I live with Jay, my crab year at the Palisades, the Pisades, which is an off-campus apartments. And then that following year, when me, Jordan, Taylin, and Alex were all on the team, we all lived in the apartments. So on one side, it was me and Jordan, and on the other side was Alex and Taylin. I think I've told this story about how we got into it and why we got into it. So if you guys wanna know why, just go back into that video. But long story short, <laughs> I have never seen any roaches in that apartment until one day I did. I was like, oh hell no. So I went and got a bug bomb, and at the time I wasn't talking to 
to my crab sisters. I really didn't want to resolve our issues, but at the same time, I didn't want to kill them with my bug bomb. So we ended up resolving our issues and I never seen another roach in that apartment again. Thank God. Let's move on. Okay, finally, Mr. Hamer went off on Dumas and all of the administrators. This one was good. He said, he not paying y'all shit. Everybody was appalled. Long story short, everybody was appalled. And this is the first time Mr. Hamer actually went off and actually said something. This time, Hamer brought Taylor to the meeting so Taylor could actually see all that Hamer was going through in order for him to get paid. And Hamer said that he was glad that he brought Taylor to that meeting so he could see all the work he's been putting behind the scenes and for him. So Hamer said at this point, he didn't care about the consequences. Quote, I had zero confidence in Dr. Belton's qualifications to run the university or his ability to be respected by Brandon Dumas, a want to be president. Hamer received two director of band offers while he was still the director at Southern University, but he let them down. April was a huge month at Southern. Mr. Hamer said, quote, I went from showing my ass in a meeting to seeing Brandon Dumas's ass literally. Hamer, stop it. Hamer thought what everybody was thinking at the time. Dumas is a married man of God. Mr. Hamer later found out that his feud with Dumas was more public than he thought because there was so many people calling him and congratulating him, but Hamer was not celebrating. Hamer knew that if the shoe was on the other foot, Dumas would take thrill to see him fall. But Hamer said he was never one to take pleasure from someone else's pain. Ultimately, the scandal resulted in the termination of Brandon Dumas. Hamer actually attended the board hearing when, when Brandon actually tried to dispute his termination. Dumas even handed the board a whole packet of Mr. Hamer's actions to try to distract from his real allegation. It didn't work. After Dumas got fired, Hamer got a call from his guardian angel, the chair of the SU System Board of Advisors. She confirmed that the 15 page document was all about him. From the top to the bottom, all the complaints and suspicions he'd been having with Hamer were all in those documents. She advised him to lawyer up because Mr. Hamer probably was gonna get a call soon from President Belton. Hamer admitted that when he got that call, his first stop wanted to be to the nearest gas station to buy the strongest bottle of whiskey he could find. But thankfully, he realized that he came too strong to beat the struggle with alcoholism. So at the end of chapter 24, Hamer shook off the demons in his head and turned up the music on his stereo to Johnny Kemp just got paid. Hammer got a raise for him and all his staff and it's Friday. Now we begin chapter 25. So this is finally the Dolls tryouts chapter. This was some shit. All right, my babies, let's go ahead and get into the nitty gritty, which is these 2017 doll tryouts. Hamer was out of town during tryouts. Honestly, his his reason for being out of town wasn't good enough for me. I feel like he should have just stayed, but that's neither here nor there at this point. But Hamer was out of town for tryouts. He had to catch a flight for 4 p.m. And he left a Tara in charge. Oh, God. Big mistake. 2017 dancing doll tryouts. So I'm going to give you guys three different perspectives. I'm gonna give my perspective first. I'm gonna give Hamer's perspective and then I will give you guys Maya and Brendan's perspective because after I read this chapter, I had really so many questions because yeah, I'll talk about it while I have questions. 2017 tryouts, me and my crab sisters, Alex, Taylin, and Jordan just finished our 2016 season as dolls and Jay actually did try out in 2015 for the 2016, but she didn't make it in 2016 due to her GPA. It's not anything that we can fault anybody else over is really because she didn't have the grades and she did not make the GPA requirements in 2016. So in 2017, me and my craft sisters all begged Jay to try it out because she did not really want to try out because one, she was scared because she knows that dolls, even dolls who have been dolls before, they don't make it. So she did not want to feel that rejection because if you guys didn't know, Jay actually tried out for dolls her freshman year and didn't make it. And she was really, really hurt about that. So when she made it in 2015, she was just like, okay, I'm a doll. But then the next year, she she didn't make it because of her GPA requirements. So we really, really had to talk Jay into trying out in 2017 so we can all be dancing as a crab class in the year 2017. So we finally talked her into it. We all spent the night together the night before, got ready together, drove together. We even stopped at Starbucks to get breakfast before we headed to the band hall. And we was just praying. We was just like, oh my gosh, just imagine if we all made this team. Little did we know, Datara had to set the fuck up. As you guys know, during trials, there's three rounds. First round, you go across the floor and then it's cut. Technique, across the floor, cut. Second round, we learn the dance and we implement our own choreography and then another cut. 
Third round is interviews and then after that you get the whole final team. You get to know who made the team or not. In the same day, how tryouts went from what I remember was after the first round, Jacqueline got cut over technique in the first round. So you already know DT was on bullshit. She already had her mind made up. She got cut after the first round on technique. Jacqueline, who has her leg behind her head. What? Who is like literally a fireball after Jordan? What? Jay got cut that first round. And then after the second round, when we learned the dance and performed our own choreography and we had callbacks and all that stuff, we later found out that Alex and Maya got cut y'all when i tell you my hands were shaking i was like what we already known in the back of our head that maya was gonna get captain because she was a standing captain after danny got hurt <sighs> you guys know danny got hurt doing the cute dog pageant my fiance's chapter i was there as well and that was crazy i remember her screaming worried about being the captain more than worrying about her knees so that's what the focus was was her coming back so she can actually finish her season that she kind of left out abruptly because her knee got knocked out because she decided that she wanted to do a q dog pageant datara actually fought for Danny to try out for the fifth year because as you guys know, fifth year dolls are very, very rare. Only the band director gets to appoint a fifth year doll to return to the team. The sponsor doesn't appoint it, they don't appoint it, and the team doesn't appoint it. It's only the band director. So according to the book, Tar came to Hamer and begged Danny to try out because honestly, Danny having a fifth rip was not even on Hamer's radar, but he agreed for her to do it. But I'm telling you guys my side of the story. So seeing Danny at tryouts was very, very surprising to me because I thought that she was done. Maya getting cut was crazy. Alex getting cut was crazy. Like why? I didn't understand why. Honestly, they took it so, they took it to the chin. They didn't scream. They didn't come busting through Hammer's door or back the fuck out of the Tara. They were very respectful. They took their stuff. They said, oh, we got cut. We just stood there with our mouths hanging open and they walked out of the band hall and went home. And that's how I remember it on my end. Looking back, I felt like I should have done more and that tryout i feel like i should have spoke up for my doll sisters now i'm going to share with you guys mr hamer's experience of 2017 tryouts so as you guys know hamer had somewhere to go and he had to be in dallas or somewhere he had a flight to catch and he had to be gone by four hamer should have never told atari that he had somewhere to go and he had to be gone by four because dt moved tryout so slow on purpose so hamer would have to miss a majority of it and oh my fucking gosh this irked my nerves at 3 p.m 3 p.m an hour before hammer had to leave dt got hammer's attention telling him bs that maya and alex were scored really low Ooh, this grind my gear <laughs> they said the same bullshit to me talking about this low scores bullshit even hamer said wait a minute how in the hell can the judges score them low there is no way that the remaining girls outdance them so in the band hall there is a dark window that overlooks basically the audition room so we can't see inside but whoever's up there looking over they can see us so mr hammer said he was up there looking down at the girls who were about to get cut which is maya and alex and i see okay dt really had bad control issues with anybody that she came across who had like a really strong personality like kayla when kayla tried to control her team because she's captain dt wanted to be the one in control now that Alex's personality is really shining through from last season. DT wanted to control Alex and she realized that Alex ain't the one to be controlled. She is not a bootlicker. Okay, if you guys don't know what a bootlicker, this is the ex example of a bootlicker. She's not an ass kisser, basically. DT told Hammer a lie. DT told Hammer that Alex or Maya, I don't know which one that she's talking about, which is bullshit, because Alex or Maya didn't do this, but one of them were wearing black and white. When all the dancers were instructed to wear all black, this was a lie. Both of them wore all black. DT DT had a problem with Alex wearing her curly hair. Datara told Hamer that her hairstyle was unfitting according to the instructors. She said that they weren't doing the choreo full out. She said that Alex and Maya were laughing at the other girls struggling to do it full out in the previous rounds. Get the fuck 
fuck out of here. Hamer admitted that he was like very hesitant when DT told him this information, but DT assured him that the judge's scoring was 100%. So Hamer unfortunately stood behind her decision. Hamer knew that even though it was DT's decision, he would definitely have to take the fire. After 10 minutes, Mr. Hamer heard screaming and crying in the hallway. This part was really, really surprising, you guys. Hamer said during the interview portion, Jordan, he called her the mobile doll. We all already know who that is. Jordan spoke out for Alex and Maya. Hamer said that Jordan took a bold chance of being cut by standing on her principles during the interview. I read this in my Jordan voice. I'm sorry, Mr. Hamer, but I don't think it's right that Alex and Maya got cut. That's exactly how I imagine she said it. Hamer said he carefully listened to Jordan's concerns. He said that she's always been respectful and never caused any trouble as she voiced her concerns. He didn't interject and put on his band director voice and tried to like overpower Jordan. He just sat and listened because he can tell that if she was willing to risk her opportunity of being a dancing doll in order to get her concerns heard, it was clearly the truth. I loved how Jordan told Mr. Hamer, DT did this a couple years ago to my captain. DT has her picks and her favorites and she, and she lied to you to get her way. I really had no idea Jordan spoke on Maya Alex in her interview. Mr. Hamer admitted that he had Jordan's words stick in his head. He thought, why would she risk not making the team? She had to have been telling the truth and DT was playing him like a fiddle. Hammer said he decided then that Jordan was captain material. Why would you risk it all to voice what you think is right? Hammer said, unfortunately, the trigger was already pulled and there was no going back. He could have went back. Clearly, Danny made the team and she's going to be captain, but Maya and Alex could have still been on the team as well. But I know that at that point, Maya was like, if I'm not going to be captain and, and I'm not appreciated here, I don't want to be on the team under Danny again. But that's not me speaking for Maya. Maya, that's just my opinion. I feel like you can always go back. You can always fix what you done wrong. Things are always fixable. And that's the way he could have fixed it. We did a reveal differently in 2017 where DT told us to send headshots. I'll show you guys my example of my headshot that I had sent her right here. This is the picture that I took for the doll reveal in 2017. And this was the actual doll reveal. When they posted this reveal, a fire erupted after not seeing Alex and Maya. Rumors started drifting everywhere because everybody blamed Hamer, not DT. And they said Hamer cut Maya because she dated the drum major, Brendan. Hamer said a mother of one of the dolls that had been cut had emailed him. In the email she brought to Mr. Hamer's attention, the policy was broken at tryouts, ensuring that none of the judges had any relation or personal relationships to the tryout candidates. And they did. And they had favorites. Hamer called DT about this relation issue and she of course denied it. Hamer later found out she lied. It was She's a liar. I was so confused on why Mr. Hamer called Brendan JT. Hamer called Brendan JT in his book. It's clear as day that he's talking about Brendan because he's talking about drum major and the drum major's girlfriend who is Maya. He was clearly talking about Brendan and he changed his name in his book for some reason. I wonder why. Mr. Hamer was talking about Brendan when he came into Mr. Hamer's office mad that he was about to cut him because of him and Maya's YouTube channel. Hamer said he didn't like Brendan's post on his social media channel and said it didn't align with the brand of the band and they were inappropriate. Hamer did not like that Brennan and Maya did a gender reveal video dressed up as a doll and a drum major without permission. Okay so that's Mr. Hamer's side of the story. I called Maya and she told me that there's three things. Three things Mr. Hamer had wrong in his book. One she has no idea why Mr. Hamer changed Brendan's name in the book to JT. I don't know. I guess to confuse people. Two Brendan never asked anything about Maya and his meeting with Mr. Hamer. That's what he told Maya that he never mentioned her at all in their meeting. Three, Maya said that the timeline is wrong of how stuff occurred. So it didn't happen in the timeline Hamer said. So that's what Maya said to give you guys some clarification on that situation. Mr. Hamer invited Maya and Alex to the band hall for a meeting with both of them at the same time to express their feelings to him. Because like I said, the words that Jordan had talking about BT is a liar and she is a a bitch. He had to hear all sides of the story. So Hamer had invited Maya and Alex in the band hall for a meeting with all of them. Of course, a lot of concerns raised had a lot to do with DT. And if you think about it, if everybody says the same thing, what does that mean? And my question is, why is DT still here? Why is DT still a sponsor to this day? Get rid of her. Keep Tracy 
Tracy is all we need. We don't need you, DC. Bye. Tell her to stay in Texas or wherever the hell she came from. And honestly, Taylor too. Hammer said that DT asked if Danny could try out again. So he, so Hammer took all of the heat because he know he could have said no to DT. Hammer said he usually doesn't show the candidates the audition score papers, but he did show them to Maya and Alex. And Alex scored a half a point from another candidate and Maya's score wasn't even close for some reason. You know what the reason was. They purposely scored Maya low to have Danny make the captain. And that's what it is. Now it makes sense. I knew what it was. The judges were told by DT that it was between Maya and Danny for that captain spot. She wanted Maya's scores low, not only to not get that captain spot, but not to be on the team at all. That is so evil. Hammer said after all the girls who tried out and all of time, they were the first two dogs to actually see their bullshit ass scores. Hammer admitted that he did not care on his decision. It was final. Now his next steps was to pick the judges himself and possibly a new doll sponsor. He should have been made this move because now it was too late and the damage has already been done. <sighs> now we move on to chapter 26. I remember our first football game of the 2017 season being hot. Hammer admitted allowing Danny to come back for a fifth rip was a good decision. I almost screamed when I read that Hammer got a text from a political man. He didn't say his name, but the political man texted him and he said, you looked good at the game. Hammer didn't think much of it because he assumed that he was talking about the band and not him. So Mr. Hammer responded, thank you kind sir. Then the man responded, yeah, looking good. I got something that I want to slide in. Delete. He indicated delete because he wanted him to delete the message. Hammer said that message put him into an instant depression. He thought about his inability to trust people, his date R word, and the fact that he's been paranoid ever since the conundrum with Dumas and he would be getting a call soon. The man with the political appointee serving at the highest level in state government was the one who texted him. I wonder who the fuck that is. OMG, Hamer told him he must have had the wrong person and have a nice day. <laughs> the man said, quote, is this the head band director at SU? If so, that message was definitely for you. Delete. Now, Mr. Hamer thought there was no plausible denial Ability. The man said everything other than my name as I responded for the last time. I'm sorry, sir. Apparently you into something that I'm not into. I do not share your sentiments. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. And then the man said, you do what I say or else. Delete. What the fuck? Mr. Hammer blocked him and became paranoid. So whenever we have performances and we eat after, the band eats by class. So for example, seniors eat first, juniors eat second, freshmen eat last. So two band students were horse playing with upperclassmen and got hurt. One's ear was bleeding and the other one got hit in the face and broke his entire nose. This was considered hazing. So Mr. Hammer suspended two of the aggressors. Mr. Hammer later found out that Taylor knew who the aggressor is, but never wanted to bring it to Mr. Hammer's attention because he was from his hometown Mobile. Mr. Hamer addresses this issue to Taylor and his response to Hamer was, I knew, but I was trying to protect you in the band. Taylor had placed blame on Mr. Hart. What the? Mr. Hart? Saying he was the mastermind, saying it was a part of the initiation process to ride bus two. This is a little side note. It was a stupid ass initiation process. One I never heard of, by the way. I didn't even know that the band even had an initiation process to ride any type of bus. Why would you even have an initiation process to ride a damn bus. When Taylor told Hamer that Mr. Hart was behind this initiation process, Hamer's mind went back to 1998 when he was a sophomore in the band and new to bus two. So the initiation process back in 1998 when Mr. Hamer was in the band was that you just had to run back and forth in between the aisles while other band members threw or hit you with whatever they could. And that was the initiation process for bus two. So back in 1998, they did not have to attack other band members to ride the damn bus but there was a process led by one of the administrative directors in the band which is crazy this unfortunately was the tradition for bus two for decades Mr. Hamer knew that Taylor was only loyal to the agenda that served him. And I really didn't know Mr. Hart and Mr. Hamer marched in the band together. Mr. Hart was a freshman while Hamer was a sophomore. That's crazy. Hamer brought the allegations to Mr. Hart that Taylor brought to him. Mr. Hart's eyes grew and was 
surprised when he learned this information. And just like me, Hamer knew Mr. Hart's character and he would never let that happen. Hart of course denied being involved and Hamer believed him wholeheartedly. Also a few students already told Hamer how it went down and it was Mr. Taylor who watched the whole thing. Now Mr. Hamer had changed how the buses will be configured. He says seniors and a few juniors will be on bus one with him. Bus two is just for the junior class. Bus three is only freshmen. Bus four was us, which is the dolls and all the girls in the band. And lastly, bus five will now contain all the sophomores in the band. In addition to the new bus rules, he took away upperclassmen's privileges of eating first, which took away our privileges too as dancing dolls because at that time I was a junior and I had to eat second to last. So even though the dolls was not involved in these hazing allegations, we still had to suffer the consequences. Hamer said if he saw or even thought he saw any form of horseplay, you will get zipped slash cut indefinitely from the band if you guys don't know what zip means. Hammer also began to keep tabs of Taylor's lies because he knew eventually he would have to fire him. All right, let's go ahead and get into chapter 27. So at the beginning of chapter 27, Hamer admitted that the most significant offense he committed was submitting false invoices. He said he has to now live with that decision for the rest of his life. Hamer admitted that he used those extra funds to pay for media equipment and two extended staff members funds, which is Garrett, who was the head of media. Ha Hamer paid him $2,000 a month. And the band's announcer. The announcer has been doing this free for 21 years until Hamer started to pay him $1,000 a month for his role. Hamer admitted that he manipulated the system to work for him and he knew he was wrong. The university took three years to finally pay Taylor directly. But when it came to the media team, the media team's equipment and the band's announcer, Hamer was on his own. In fall 2017, Mr. Hamer was assigned, wait for it, his fifth supervisor. Hamer then learns that he should have been been using a private account to put the band's funds in and not his personal account. Lastly, Mr. Hamer ended the chapter saying that he knew that his days were numbered, but he had no idea that it was coming a lot sooner than he thought. Now we go ahead and get into chapter 28. So Hamer put Taylor in charge of the pre-festival where Taylor would have to get the judges, trophies, food, etc. Hamer wanted Taylor to have some skin in the game. He used that phrase a lot, skin in the game, because he had grown tired of his ways. He was already trying to decide whether or not if he was going to fire Taylor or not. Hamer predicted that Taylor would fumble while organizing the pre-festival and he would have to come in last minute to fix it. He was right. Sharon the R word came back again with a new lawsuit. Hamer told investigators everything including the date R incident and they cleared Hamer from the investigation. Due to the two band members getting hurt due to hazing allegations, the university paid investigators $30,000 to investigate the band for hazing. And I remember this investigation. We were told that we were no longer to be able to call crabs crabs they were supposed to be called freshmen now no more crabs because of the hazing allegations the investigators found nothing then Hamer's sixth boss got hired and of course he still had to jump through the same hoops of trying to be heard this supervisor did not last long because in the same year he was assigned to his seventh supervisor within four years with three supervisor in the year 2017 alone so that shows you how Southern University ran their system. Hammer brought his concerns with Taylor to his new supervisor and he ends the chapter saying that this will come back to haunt him soon. Now we get into chapter 29. Oh y'all we getting through this. We got five more chapters left okay. So hang in there with me May babies. If you guys like this video so far of course make sure you guys comment down below. Let me know what you guys think and smash that notification bell so you know whenever I make another banger and let's go ahead and get into chapter 29. Now it's January 2018. Hamer is getting ready to prepare fundraising for the Rose Bowl Parade. And by the way, band directors receiving honorariums aren't anything new. It's normal band practice. And in February of 2018 was the last time Hamer experienced a season of true happiness. Hamer knew that his 40th birthday would be the last hoorah for a little while because he had a surgical procedure scheduled for the following week for his tonsillitis. Two weeks after Hamer got his tonsils removed, he decided to be outside around the students and enjoy the weather. When two news people came to him with a sneak attack with their cameras on, the investigative reporter began to ask Hamer what he was doing with the dancing doll fees. Hamer had to decide whether he was going to run away or stand his ground. He decided to stand his ground. Hamer 
said coming out of a two-week recovery from getting his tonsils removed to a reporter in his face was definitely a challenge. It's now March and it's the band director's consortium in Atlanta. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, consortium. In Atlanta. And Hamer said he didn't know this would be his last time conducting this performance. Hamer wanted so bad to terminate Taylor and Jabari. Jabari knew every move Hamer made thanks to Taylor. Hamer caught onto their games. He noticed every time he ignores Jabari's calls, he would get a call from Taylor shortly after. Not only did Hamer notice, but Brian noticed as well. Hamer said his final straw with Taylor was in Dallas. Hammer told Mr. Taylor to stay your motherfucking ass home. Sit this one out. Quote, I need you to hold everything down at work. The rest of the staff and I are going on the road to recruit. <laughs> Oh, put put. Taylor responds, what am I supposed to do at work while everybody is gone? <laughs> Hamer responds, do what you normally do. Mr. Hamer said it was time for the NBM team to be the first one on the chopping block. Jabari got an email from Hamer saying, I regret to inform you, we are no longer needed of your services here. <laughs> Hamer wanted to wait to fire Taylor because they had a few more band performances in the semester. This was a huge mistake. Because of course, that information that Taylor was gonna get fired was leaked. Now we finally get into chapter 30, you guys. We got four more to go. We almost done. Okay, chapter 30. Mr. Hamer said April 2018 was the detonator. The tabloids continued with the headlines of negative coverage on, quote, the SU band director. When Mr. Hamer's brother Niles pointed out the fact that all band directors get honorarium, not one band director stood up for Mr. Hamer. The lack of support and the denial of the honorarium knowledge was extremely hurtful to Mr. Hamer and their private support meant nothing. In April 2018, Taylor came to Hamer's office to confront him about a screenshot which showed that he was next up getting fired. Taylor was so nervous that his hands was trembling. He handed Hamer the phone. Mr. Hamer gave him his phone back. He said, go rehearse your band, man. Through tears forming in his eyes, he responded, man, I hope this isn't true. We're a good team. We're like the Chicago Bulls of the 1990s. Hamer said, who was that in that screenshot? <laughs> Long story short, Taylor lied. He said he ain't know him, he did. Hamer admitted that he was foolish of letting known snakes in the door because he knew from the beginning that Taylor was a snake, but he continued to work with him. He continued to appoint him as assistant band director. Well, I don't know why he did that. Why did he not appoint Brian, who was his right-hand man? Why Taylor? And he didn't appreciate it anyway. So chapter 31, y'all. At this point, this whole book has been giving me anxiety <laughs> this whole time. So here we go, chapter 31. Thursday, April 26, 2018. It was the band's banquet day. Wow. Hamer received a call from his then seventh supervisor. So when he was ripping and running around, he had missed his one o'clock meeting with his supervisor. And Mr. Hamer's supervisor was like, I need you to pull over. It sounds like you're driving. Mr. Hamer said, yes, I am driving, but I am on the interstate. I can't just pull over. But you can go ahead and tell me what you need to tell me. His supervisor said, Mr. Hamer, as your direct supervisor, it gives me no pleasure to say this, but I am following an order to tell you that either you resign or you will be terminated. Mr. Hamer responded, what the hell? do you mean ah ugh. long story short the conversation ended and mr hamer about to start drinking he told brian fuck them fire me god damn it but brian assured him that he better go to the banquet and his students need to see him it's better to hear from him than the news and social media outlets and i'm glad that brian told hamer this because we really did they changed the locks to mr hamer's office so he couldn't even get inside the band hall to not only get his stuff but get the trophies for the band members for the banquet. So all of the trophies and everything, all the awards for the band members that's been working hard all year was locked in the office and they didn't care to open it up for us just because they didn't want Mr. Hamer to have access to his office. Even after this, Hamer still insisted, Brian still didn't tell Taylor a damn thing about what's going on. Now you guys, I'm gonna play a clip of Hamer's speech at the banquet. I talked a little bit about this, but I was trying to figure out whether I was gonna play it or not. But you know what? Now is the perfect time to play it because now you guys can get the mood of how this band banquet really went because I never really seen Hamer cry, just be sad, period. I haven't seen Hamer be anything but confident. So this was the speech that I caught on my Snapchat. Thank God I still had it in my memories. And y'all, they was messing with Mr. Hamer's mic on purpose. And I'm saying all I like to say this, the legacy will continue. You guys, it's been an honor my life. It's been so while Mr. Hamer was saying his speech, 
Taylor had snuck away in the hallway. Brian followed him to see what the hell he was up to. And Brian said Taylor claimed that he was trying to get somebody to open Mr. Hamer's office to get the trophies. But Mr. Hamer knew that was a lie. Hamer said it was a sad way to close a successful year as a vision he boldly stated four years ago came to pass. Hamer said he wanted to walk away with his head held high and he wanted the president chancellor to tell him why he has been terminated. So at this point, his supervisor was playing games with him. He told him that he could possibly get his job back and that he couldn't and that he could again and that he couldn't. He could get his stuff and then he still had to work a little bit. It was like a lot of mind games in this next couple pages. But even after Hamer was fired, he still wanted to fire Taylor. <laughs> On Sunday, April 29th, 2018, Hamer considered Brian to be the younger brother he never had. And this was interesting because I knew that Hamer and Brian were close, but I didn't think that they were that close. And now it makes sense because ever since Hamer left and Taylor became band director, Brian left short after Hamer left and became the band director at TSU. Now it makes sense. Mr. Hamer said, on the way back to Baton Rouge, I had a great revelation. Brian Simmons had always been a good friend. When times are at their most challenging and you feel that you've hit rock bottom, life has a way of revealing who is a real friend versus who is a fair weather friend. He stayed in my corner, whether right or wrong. And even though he had no clue of some of the wrongdoings that I've done, later when he found out my crimes, he supported me. He never enabled me. Even when he would tell me when I was wrong, his love and support for me never wavered. He and I could turn the darkest situation into a funny moment. I appreciated that about him as laughter is truly the best medicine. It was interesting to hear that Hamer said he was sad that he never got one call from his father figure, Lawrence Jackson. Mr. J had an abrupt leave. According to Mr. Hamer, Mr. J fed him lies telling him that he would show him the ropes before he just threw him in there. And when it came time for Mr. Hamer to be band director, Mr. J just ran and didn't give him any type of guidance. He didn't call him and check up on him to see how things are going. He wasn't available basically. So at this point, it really shocked him that he found out that his predecessor Mr. J was now the band director interim. So when Mr. Hammer got fired he really thought that he could reach out to Mr. J and just talk to him and like get some advice for him about what he should do next. And when he called Mr. J, Mr. J would always answer in like a funny hey what you doing tone you know type of like a light heart response but this time he didn't have the same response and he interrupted Mr. Hamer while he was asking Mr. J for help and said hey let me call you right back Mr. Hamer said that he had full confidence that Mr. J will call him back because he always looked at him as a father figure but long story short that man never called back and then he found out later that he is the new interim band director he never called Mr. Hamer back ever okay so Mr. Hamer visited the band hall to pick up some stuff right I think this is his last time visiting the band hall, I believe. And he's seen Mr. Taylor pull up in his truck. Ooh, it gets spicy. So Mr. Hamer knocks on Mr. Taylor's window and was like, hey man, who the hell is Marcus Mason? And this is a fake name. I really want to know who the fuck Marcus Mason is in real life. If you guys read the book and you went to SU, comment down below and let me know who this Marcus Mason is. When he asked him about Marcus Mason, he looked like a deer in headlights. Uh, uh, uh. He was on the phone. Can I call you back? The way Mr. Hamer wrote this in the stuttering, I can just hear Taylor's voice. Long story short, Hammer caught Taylor in a lie and Taylor told him to pray with him. This is so funny, you guys. I have to read this. Page 291. He said he did not want Kendrick to pray for him because he's been praying on him for years. This is Mr. Taylor. Man, you know my heart. I can hear Taylor right now. Man, you know my heart. After Mr. Hammer got fired, Mr. J already put Taylor in the band director's chair. Trials came through fast that year okay and i feel like it came fast on purpose because they want to make sure they get this team after hamer's termination he was a talk of the town plastered on every news station and often the butt of the joke mr hamer wanted to hold his ground and didn't delete his social media so he can see all the people who claim to be rooting for him but really posting memes behind his back hamer knew that he needed to get out of baton rouge no future in br was possible mr hamer continues saying whether right or wrong i had his back throughout his entire tenure and he couldn't even have my my back one time the man i knew and respected was not real the last quote unquote superhero in my mind was no longer i thought of the many times i put his needs and once before my ex-wife and family i thought about the late nights i spent in the office my first couple of years on the job typing creating documents and doing tons of paperwork for him because he didn't know how to type shade <laughs> I thought about how I let him manipulate me into changing the handbook to get rid of a few dancing dolls. 
I wonder what dancing dolls Mr. J got rid of in 2008. Not only did Mr. J not fight for him, but he pushed for Taylor to be the new band director. And that really, really, really hurt Mr. Hamer to the core. He thought that he would genuinely have his back at the time he needed him the most. Okay, so we were still dolls when Mr. Hamer got terminated and we still had a few, I believe, more parade performances. I don't remember what performances we had left, but we had a meeting in the band hall and I remember Mr. J talking to us. This is the first time that I really genuinely even heard Mr. J talk or say more than a few words besides hello or how my baby's doing because that's what he calls the dolls is his babies taking the interim band director spot because the university said that the, he was the only one who was capable of having that position at that time after Mr. Hamer got terminated he made it be known to us dancing dolls and band members that he did not want to be interim band director he said he's been there done that and he likes to play his golf way too much to come back so he let it be known him being there was only limited ironically so as Mr. J, ironically, as soon as Mr. J was done talking to us, Taylor came and spoke to us. His speech was terrible. He was giving exactly what Mr. Hamer was saying in his book. Like he really wanted you to pray with him. And I feel like at that point, Taylor really did need God because he knew he was doing something really messed up and only God can forgive him for that. So I understood why he wanted us to pray for him. And it was ironic that now as he wanted training for the director and Mr. J did to Taylor what he should have done with Mr. Hamer. Mr. Hamer ended chapter 31 saying that Kendrick backstabbed Mr. J, the very man who pushed for him to be the director. Taylor had backstabbed Mr. J. Chapter 32. Oh, we got two more chapters left. Okay, my baby. So in May 2018, Hammer went to his office for the first time since his termination, but he forgot to clear his bottom left drawer. Huge mistake. Hammer decided to fight for his job and appeal his termination. But then again, Mr. Hammer asked himself, why? Why even fight for this job? when it's been a headache since day one. But Mr. Hamer ultimately said to himself that he needed to clear his name and fight for his students. I remember this meeting in the administrative office, administration office, I don't know what to call it. And I gave the full story in part one. So if you guys haven't seen part one, definitely check that out to get this little side story. But long story short, they rushed us to speak. We didn't really get to say all of the stuff that we really wanted to say. My fourth year in the band, we have new instruments. We have better funding. We have more things than we ever had in the whole era of this band. They weren't really trying to hear it anyway. They rushed us out of the whole entire room. We couldn't even stand in the room while the hearing was going on so that's basically what went down now we get to page 300 and mr hamer is giving instructions to brian so he can make sure mr hart knew how to go about verifying the band and dance camp funds and mr j must have been right next to brian while he was on the phone with hamer because mr j said hey how you doing man hamer was like i'm doing just fine he was short in his response he didn't want to talk to him he was still very upset how he sold him out it took every ounce of discipline for him not to curse out the man who he once viewed as a father figure Mr. J said, Nate, you gonna be just fine. You were a good band director. By the way, South Carolina State needs a band director. You should consider applying. Mr. Hamer said, I was a good band director. Yeah, okay, I'll talk to you later. He hung up the phone. He said that he was so livid at Mr. J's response to him. Mr. Hamer said he just filed his appeal to get his job back and Mr. J was already counting him out. In fact, it hadn't even been a week since he was terminated and Mr. J refused to come around just to give advice when and he was the director, but he was already on campus running things and collecting his sellout pay. At this point, Mr. Hamer had endured a lot, but this moment was the most hurtful to Mr. Hamer. So the next hearing wasn't until July of 2018, which is after the season, during the summertime, when all the students have already gone home for the summer. So we can't fight for him anymore after this. And moving forward, Taylor claims that he never got any type of honorariums in his whole entire time working for the band. Lies. Mr. Hamer even had a reinstatement video that he posted on his social media i even posted it on my social media the dolls had posted it the band members had posted it we really wanted mr hammer to come back we did not want a new band director i'm sorry we didn't want mr j and we knew that brian probably wouldn't get picked either so we just wanted mr hammer back because he really put a fire under us that no other band director could have done we all supported him in trying to get his job back but as you guys know it all fell on deaf ears mr hammer said on the bottom of page 304 quote my life no longer had purpose and I no longer wanted to live. Luckily, Brian Simmons had the access code to get into my apartment or I probably would have been successful in an attempt to take my own life. It was a very dark time in my life. In fact, it was the darkest time of my life. Brian Simmons often reminds me of how he visited me daily, 
ready for any and everything. Brian said, quote, on some days you were good, but on other days I will go to your apartment and you will be passed out or rambling saying crazy stuff. Long story short, Mr. Hamer did not believe what Brian was saying until Brian actually showed him a video of him rambling and being drunk. He, Mr. Hamer had a revelation. He did want to live. Chef Nate was in full healing mode. Mr. Hamer said he knew he needed at least a year off to get his mental back. So now Mr. Hamer finally got called into the hearing so he can try to fight for his job back, basically. Honestly, at this point, Mr. Hamer was over about getting his job back. He was just ready to move on with his life. But it was funny, you guys. Mr. Hamer was mocking his boss, Dr. Belton, the president. He said, quote, I've always known him to be very delayed in his speech, often pausing in the middle of his statements with uh, uh, uh. On this day, Dr. Belton did his homework because I didn't hear one single uh, uh, through his whole address to me in front of the board. Dr. Belton said, I used to be a Nathan Hamer fan, not only just a fan of the band. As I observed your mistakes in your criminal ways, I began to understand that perhaps you shouldn't have been the director in the first place. You're obviously not equipped for the job. Mr. Hamer said he was taken aback and we could pay whoever I see fit with band money or any other money. Mr. Hamer was bewildered. He said he just blurted it out. Well, it's a good thing that I'm fired because you have the right band director now band money is for the band period also if i'm not fit to be the band director you're not fit to be the president mr hamer said dr belton was shaken by his clapback as he forgot his prepared remarks mr hammer's clapback took him off his game that he started speaking with his usual uh uh, uh. he said you were arrogant and never asked for uh uh, uh help <laughs> i can't so long story short mr hammer's appeal to his termination was denied and he's officially been terminated from being the director of bands at southern university and mr hammer said that he was happy and sad at the same time because he was just ready to be done with this and just start over start a new life he's tired of being depressed and honestly i'm tired of reading about him being depressed <laughs> hammer said i was happy that i could move on but he was sad that the enemy won not only did they want him terminated but they wanted him under the jail mr hammer said that he had to prepare a getaway plan in the meantime to get out of louisiana houston texas was the perfect place for a fresh start mr hammer ended the chapter saying quote since i was unofficially unemployed could no longer afford my nice apartment or the mortgage on my flood damaged home that i haven't lived in since 2016 I moved out of my apartment to an extended state type of motel for $800 for August and I plan to move to Houston by September. Now we continue to the second to last chapter, chapter 33. Mr. Hammer moved to Houston and got a nice house in the hood. <laughs> he invited his family over for his first Thanksgiving in the house. And as Mr. Hammer reassured his family that the neighborhood was safe, gunshots started coming off and one of his family members had to protect his niece and nephew because they didn't want no stray bullets coming through the house. But thank God nobody was harmed on page 317 i was very surprised that mr hamer applied for the director of band position at grambling Grambling state university Pew! and on page 318 they finally found the false invoices mr hamer been scared that they was gonna find the summer of 2019 made mr hamer face his pride by now he's been an unemployed for over a year and his lease ran out and he no longer can afford his rent hamer said he would rather be homeless than return to Baton Rouge. Mr. Hammer had to swallow his pride and accept that he needed a roommate. And Mr. Hammer continued to say, while on my aggressive search for employment, I received a call from the director of the Texas Southern University Ocean of Soul marching band. This was a no brainer for Mr. Hammer. He was living with someone and was desperate for any type of income. Mr. Hammer accepted his offer. Unfortunately, Hammer's interaction with the Ocean of Soul band only lasted a few days. Hammer really could feel that nobody really wanted him there. They were taking pictures and videos of him just sitting there. It wasn't the right atmosphere for him at that time. Mr. Hamer also had a job working at an elementary school, arranging music and teaching music. And when he heard the arrangement that he wrote in his headphones, he started to cry, remembering the reason that he fell in love with music. At the end of page 322, Mr. Hamer said, things were finally working out. Now, my babies, we get into the final chapter of Juked. Okay, my babies, let's get into chapter 34. So Mr. Hamer's investigation now went further than the board of ethics it went to the fbi the federal bureau of investigation i think that's what it stands for mr hamer had to drive back to baton rouge and face questions by the fbi 
FBI that the FBI already knew the answers. The honorarium issue had got dropped by the FBI as they learned that the honorarium was a standard practice in Louisiana and that band directors regularly received them. And it's crazy because Mr. Hamer said they dropped the honorarium issues because they learned that band directors are supposed to receive them. But really the honorarium issue is the reason why he got terminated. Now Garrett, why you lie and say you never got paid? Because you even told the dolls that Mr. Hamer cuts you a check. So that's crazy that when the FBI asked Garrett, did he receive any money from Hamer? He said no. The FBI was able to verify that I paid the staff from false invoices and band camp revenue and informed me that running funds through my account could potentially cause a bigger issue. Even though I had my reasons and could explain them, it still doesn't justify the criminal act I committed. I take full responsibility for committing fraud, but I was relieved to have evidence that there was no personal gain. Moving forward in the chapter, it was just really a waiting game for Mr. Hamer after they had this FBI investigation questioning. Unfortunately, because Mr. Hamer admitted to them that he put it in his personal account, Mr. Hamer's case went from a civil case to a criminal case, and Mr. Hamer had to get a second attorney. Hamer was over this whole entire thing because even me, I'm even over it reading this book. So he just took the plea deal. On page 324, quote, June 2020, I pleaded guilty through virtual federal hearing with a judge and was charged with a federal felony. Instantly, I felt the weight and gravity of the moment. All my life, I worked to make my family and community proud in a blink of an eye. I felt like I let them down. I was now a convicted felon. It was a surreal experience. I'm sure it was. And the next step was his sentencing. Mr. Hamer was waiting and waiting and waiting. Around the middle of March, he finally got the call that his sentence hearing was set. So basically he'll hear what sentence he'll get after he just had his conviction. Mr. Hamer said he was a ball of emotions. He cried every tear, said every prayer, talked about his situation with everyone he loved and cared to share it with. He never lost hope, but he knew he had to be prepared to be sentenced to prison. That's some shit. I can't even imagine. Long story short, my babies, this is so fucked up, but the SU elites that Mr. Hamer has been giving foreshadowing throughout the whole entire book, they finally had their in power game at this point with the FBI because they added an extra $45,000 to Mr. Hamer's appeal saying that he stole an additional 45,000, just the right amount to guarantee prison time. The SU elites made sure that Mr. Hamer got prison time by adding this extra amount that was not even confirmed. And because Mr. Hamer already signed the plea deal, he just had to go with it. Mind you, it's been three years. It's been three years since Mr. Hamer been fired and he's still waiting on to see if he's going to go to jail or not. So we later find out that Mr. Hamer was sentenced to 14 months in prison. I wonder what that was like because Mr. Hamer didn't say anything about his prison experience in this book. Maybe he's going to write it in the next book. He just explains of how he basically had to wait until he got a call from his probation officer giving him a place to report and turn himself into the prison. It's crazy how you can prepare yourself to go to prison for over a year. But Mr. Hamer said that he looked at it as something positive. This would be a fresh start. He'll be coming out of prison a whole different person. That's what he wanted to do was just build himself back up in those 14 months. Okay, now we are on the last page and I'm going to read this last couple paragraphs to end this book. Mr. Hamer said, quote, we made it back to the prison. The correctional officers took me into custody. My eyes full of tears, hindered me from turning around and telling my brother goodbye. Wow. It was nearly 20 years to the day that I received my bachelor's degree in music education from Southern University. Everything I've accomplished in my life no longer mattered. I was now, quote, one of them. The guards quickly let me know that life would be different for the next 13 months by the last thing they told my brother. He won't be able to call you or the rest of your family members for 20 days. Inmate 03184-509 will be placed in a quarantine cell before we place him in the general population. Mr. Hamer ends chapter 30 by saying it was at that moment that I knew I would need God now more than ever and that's the end of Juked. Okay my baby so after chapter 34 it's the afterword. To tell you the truth he basically sums up everything that he said throughout the book and his thoughts moving forward. I'm not gonna really give too much of a review for that because I already know this video is already probably an hour long because I've been here for four hours so I'm just guesstimating and then he ends the afterword with quote as I embrace my truth I I usher in a new Nathan B. Hamer, open-hearted and honest, driven by purpose and steadfast commitment to never give up on people. May my story inspire others to listen to their instincts and embrace their path with unwavering courage, with deep gratitude,
gratitude in a new profound piece, Nathan B. Hamer. Hamer time. Okay, my babies, that is the end of Juked. So let's go ahead and get into my final thoughts of Mr. Hamer's book, Juked. So first off, I feel that Mr. Hamer never deserved to go to prison. If you guys heard from part one, you guys know that as soon as Mr. Hamer was gone, that was the end of 2015. And I didn't know that that would be the end of me being a doll. And you guys, I was very, very, very hurt when all that happened. I was a doll for a long time. I was a doll for three years and it was a huge part of my life for a very long time. When that got ripped away from me, the only person that I could think about to try to fight for me is Mr. Hamer. That's when I sent that text message that you guys saw in part one. But everything happens for a reason and I really needed that break to actually enjoy being a college student, actually enjoying my HBCU, enjoying my sorority, being more active on campus and like just, just enjoying life as a student, as a regular student and not having to rip and run. Even though I do disagree with Mr. Hamer ever getting fired, I feel that everything genuinely happens for a reason, good or bad, and karma is real. So whatever happens, to those people who fucked over Mr. Hamer, they're gonna get their karma and that's that. As you guys know, Mr. Hamer was very, very prideful and he felt like he was very untouchable, but I feel like this whole experience had him learn that everybody can be replaced. And like he said, the mentor sometimes needs a mentor. So never did he think that he would be that person that would be replaceable as well. So that was his wake up call. And I also wanna add, because I know 10 times out of 10, Mr. Hamer is probably gonna be watching this video. And I see that you acknowledge all of your wrongdoing when when it comes to hiding the band's funds and etc but when it comes to Maya and Brendan I feel like you need to reach out to them and genuinely apologize to them about what happened in 2017 tryouts and I'm just gonna leave it at that my next thought DT gotta go Taylor gotta go and then I'll be happy and then we'll have our legacy. Yeah, y'all, they gotta go. And Mr. Hamer said he been struggling with this for four years. I already know Mr. Taylor struggling as we speak. Blink twice if you need us to send you some help, Mr. Taylor. Let's just see how long Mr. Taylor is gonna be band director. But you guys, I'm about to go ahead and end this video with some great news, okay? I just got a call from my doll sister, Naomi, and she gave me some good news. And by this time, it's already out. But congratulations to my doll all little sisters, Naomi, Milan, Soya, and Ashlyn on crossing Beta Psi spring 2024. That's crazy. It has not been aligned really since 2020, really. So four years it hasn't been aligned and these dolls are AKAs. And I'm so excited to just see them. We're at beta side and just giving pure excellence as doll Ks, okay? Cause we needed them bad. Anyway, my babies, my final thoughts is Mr. Hamer, shout out to you. You will always be my band director. Thank you guys so much for watching my reaction to Mr. Hammer's book, Juked. I hope you liked this reaction video. If you guys liked it, make sure you thumbs up and smash that notification bell so you know whenever I make a new post. And until next time, I will see you in the next banger, baby. Bye.